Erev Tov, everybody. Good, uh, good to see so many people here coming on to our, uh, our call. We want to welcome everyone to our special presentation of the Dr. Jeffrey Kramer Bioethics Initiative at TBS. And uh, this is our first time doing this on Zoom, and it's so wonderful to see uh, close to 200 people on so far, and I'm sure that number will climb over the next few minutes um, as, uh, as we get started. Um, we are uh, always proud to be able to present programs from our Dr. Jeffrey Kramer Bioethics Initiative at TBS, and uh, we're able to do that thanks to our founding partners, Audrey Neal Asbel, Stanley and Doris Ravitz, Acts of Loving Kindness Fund, and of course, Dr. Jeff, Zichron Ali Bracha, Blessed Memory, and Jane Kramer, and Kent and Kent. And we also present uh, these bioethics programs in partnership with the Jewish Logical Seminary in New York, and I am a uh, very happy and proud to welcome onto this call uh, Chancellor Arnold Eisen of JTS, who uh, who's on here as well with us uh, this evening. It's uh, good to virtually see you uh, see you here. Nice to have you back at TBS, as it were, Chancellor Eisen. Um, I also uh, want to say a, a thank you too to uh, Alex Weinberg, who's uh, running production for this. Um, oh, has finally changed uh, my name to his name, <laughs> so it's not me in two places, and uh, we appreciate his work in uh, in making this happen. I also just want to note, uh, as we all know, we're on the Zoom format. It's our first time that we've done a program like this on Zoom. So uh, we're going to keep everyone muted except for our speakers. Um, and I want to thank everyone who submitted questions in advance because of the format, the number of people were not able to do questions during the, uh, during the presentation, after the presentation. But we have a good group of questions from, uh, that were submitted beforehand, and we're presenting that to our, to our speakers. Um, as we were preparing for this, and uh, our speakers, Dr. Seth Rosenbaum, Dr. Joel Kravis, and Dr. Jeffrey Skolnick, who I'll introduce more formally in a minute, as we're preparing for this, uh, Dr. Skolnick, who uh, uh, has a wonderful sense of humor, uh, suggested that I open it by, uh, by uh, asking if there's a, a blessing for COVID-19, to which the answer probably would be, a blessed for COVID-19, may God bless and keep it far away from us, like the old joke from Fiddler on the Roof goes. But we know, sadly, that it is not far from us. Um, it's actually quite close to us, uh, no matter where we find ourselves. We know there are people in our community and, and people around the world and in our country who have uh, been infected with this, uh, with this deadly virus. And um, our whole country and the whole world is uh, working to confront it. And uh, I'm very mindful that tonight we're gathering together for this program um, on a Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the beginning of the Hebrew month of Nisan, which began today, um, this, uh, this day that's ending. And there's a saying in the Talmud about Nisha, Nisan that says, Benisan galu, benisan atidin ligael, which means in the month of Nisan, our ancestors were redeemed from Egypt, and in Nisan, we too will be redeemed. Now, what the Talmud's talking about, of course, is the redemption or the exodus from Egypt that we'll celebrate with, a, uh, with Passover in a couple weeks, uh, which I'm sure will be a very different Passover for many of us this year. Um, but our tradition reminds us in this saying that in Nisan, our ancestors were redeemed from Egypt, and in Nisan, we too will be redeemed, that our people have faced many difficult moments in our history, and with each one, we've been able to prevail. And it's reflected, I think, best in the language of the Haggadah, which says, we've gone from Abdut l'cheirut, from slavery to freedom, miagon l'simcha, from sorrow to joy, from Eva l'yom tov, from mourning to celebration, from afela l'ora, from darkness to light, to mishibu l'gula, and from slavery to freedom to redemption. And we know, as the Haggadah tells us, that God does not make this transition for us but rather God helps us by giving us our values and pointing us in the right direction and also helping give us strength to face our challenges. And today we're facing challenges in our families, in our community, with our students and our jobs. And I know this is especially the case for our medical professionals. And I know that there are many doctors and nurses and hospital administrators and mental health professionals that are on the call tonight and are on the front lines of this pandemic. I just want to start by acknowledging that and saying thank you to all of you for all of your heroic efforts to uh, help combat this pandemic. We appreciate everything that you're doing, and it truly is Avodat Kodesh. It truly is holy work. And we're so appreciative of your efforts and your expertise 
in helping us navigate this very challenging time. We are blessed to have many medical professionals at TBS, and I know that a number of them have been working directly with patients and on research for COVID-19. And we're grateful that tonight our presenters, Dr. Seth Rosenbaum, Dr. Joe Kravitz, and Dr. Jeffrey Skolnick, we appreciate them volunteering their expertise to have our conversation tonight. And in a moment, I'll introduce them, and each one of them will make a presentation from their experience on COVID-19. And once I finish, we'll move to the questions that uh, we've collected over the course of the last few days. So let me introduce our presenters. Uh, presenting first will be Dr. Seth Rosenbaum. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum did his internal medicine internship and residency at Cooper University Hospital and a fellowship in infectious diseases there as well. And he received his master's of medical management um, uh, from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University, and he is board certified in infectious diseases. And currently he is the chief medical officer of Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and the clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And also just add that uh, Seth has been uh, very helpful for us at TBS, very generous at this time, along with Joel as well, um, in uh, helping us uh, make very tough decisions around here in light of what's been, what's been happening. We're very appreciative for that. Dr. Joel Kravitz went to medical school at uh, McGill in Montreal, where he did his residency in emergency medicine at Royal Victoria Hospital. And currently, he is the attending physician for emergency medicine at Capital Health. And uh, where Dr. Rosenbaum is infectious disease and Dr. Kravitz is emergency medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Skolnick has the research side of our team. He's the vice president of clinical development at Innovio, a small biotechnology company outside of Philadelphia that studies DNA medicines in the treatment of infectious diseases and cancers. Dr. Skolnick is a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and has published many papers on oncology clinical trials. He's also an attending physician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And uh, I know I've learned a lot from them as we've uh, prepared for, uh, for tonight. And I know we're all looking forward to hearing uh, their expertise and, and help us navigate uh, this difficult moment uh, in, our, in our history. And uh, we're gonna begin tonight with, uh, with Dr. Rosenbaum is going to start speaking from the infectious disease perspective, and then from Dr. Kravitz, and finally from Dr. Skolnick. Dr. Rosenbaum. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, you, Rabbi, and the entire TBS community uh, for having us on this evening. We hope uh, to uh, answer a lot of the questions and concerns that you all have regarding the current COVID-19 pandemic that we are facing here in the United States as well as worldwide. We will do our best to try and answer as many questions as we can, and we hope you find this evening very informational. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. To give us a, a timeline of, of what, oh, can we go back one please, Alex? To give us a timeline of where we are uh, currently and where we were with the COVID-19, a pneumonia which was associated with the Hunan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan, Hubei province of China of an unknown cause was first reported to the WHO, which is the World Health Organization country office in China on the 31st of December, 2019. The outbreak was declared a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January, 2020. On February 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization announced an official name for the disease that is causing the 2019 novel coronavirus outbreak, first identified in Wuhan, China. The new name of this disease is Coronavirus Disease 2019, abbreviated as COVID-19. In COVID-19, CO stands for Corona, the VI stands for Virus, and the D for the disease. Formerly, this disease was referred to as the 2019 Novel Coronavirus or 2019 NCOV. The first confirmed case of 2019 Novel Coronavirus infection here in the United States was reported on January 20th. 2020 
in Snohomish County, Washington. Next slide, please. What I would like to show to you is, is, is a uh, snapshot of what the current state of affair worldwide regarding the coronavirus. Uh, this was taken and it's fully accessible to the public. It's a uh, Center for System Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins and the address, uh, the web link you can see is above GIS and data maps .com. What you can see currently, this was a snapshot that was last updated yesterday evening uh, which showed total confirmed cases of coronavirus worldwide were 468,523, and there were a total of 21,192 deaths. Uh, as of this evening, I was I updated the slides, and we currently are at 526,044 cases worldwide with 23,709 deaths associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, it is widespread worldwide at this time. Uh, this is fully accessible, so feel free to access this uh, data on your own time. Next slide, please. I zoomed in on New Jersey, specifically our area in Camden County, New Jersey. Uh, as of last night, we can see there were 61 confirmed cases in Camden County, New Jersey. Uh, of, of them, one of them was a death. Uh, Currently, uh, those numbers have gone up significantly in New Jersey overall uh, as the testing becomes more prominent in the United States. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 U.S. at a glance, this is a quick snapshot of what's going on here in the United States. Uh, total cases were 54,453 with total deaths of 737 with the jurisdictions reporting 54. Uh, as of this afternoon, updated cases in the United States were 68,440 with 994 deaths uh, reported. March 4th, 2020 was the official first identification of New Jersey's first presumptive positive case of the novel coronavirus. Next slide, please. This is uh, also free to the public. It's a, a newjersey.gov or nj.gov website. They have a dashboard that's updated regularly. As you can see, this was last taken yesterday afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, in New Jersey alone, there were 4,402 positive cases with 62 associated deaths. As of 2 p.m. this afternoon, unfortunately, uh, those positives have skyrocketed uh, up this time to 6,876 cases with 81 deaths and 73 of them being in Camden County of the total positive cases. Uh, today marks the date that had the highest increase in positive case reporting in New Jersey with over 2,400 cases increased from as of yesterday. I highlighted on the left in blue Camden County test results as of yesterday, but as of today, they are 73. Next slide, please. Uh, as a note also, New Jersey is now uh, second in the nation uh, of reporting positive cases, secondary to New York. Uh, of the cases that have been reported in the United States by source of exposure, meaning how patients acquired the disease, uh, as of yesterday, travel related were 584 with close contacts of 986. And what we call in the medical field under investigation or a source has not yet been identified was 52,883. Uh, to date, uh, those numbers have increased to uh, 636 cases of travel-related, 1,074 close contacts under investigation or 66,730, bringing the grand total to 68,440 cases currently here in the United States. Next case. Uh, this graph was taken from the CDC uh, website, which shows the number of specimens that were tested for what we call the SARS-CoV or otherwise known as the coronavirus by CDC labs. And what I want to point out here is that in the beginning of, of the epidemic, uh, there were very few uh, tests being sent to the CDC. And as you can see, as, as, the, as the pandemic moves to the right on the bottom, the color of public health labs continued to increase, but the, those that were sent to the CDC labs still remain quite low. And as you can see, going from now all the way up far right, the amount that are in the public health labs have decreased because of the, uh, the uh, emergence of the uh, private commercial labs also apparent right now. 
And the take home point here is that we are seeing significant lags in the turnaround times from the CDC labs for us getting results, as well as quicker turnaround times for some of the commercial private labs, uh, which makes it a lot easier for us to help uh, take certain patients out of isolation or give diagnosis in a much more rapid time frame, which is really important for when you're when you're dealing with epidemiology and public health risks. Next. So I would like to uh, go over a few symptoms of what the coronavirus uh, causes. Uh, and just some, some uh, background, the coronaviruses are a large family of viruses which may cause illnesses in animals or humans. In humans, there are very, several known coronaviruses uh, that actually cause respiratory infections ranging from the common cold to a more severe disease such as the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, otherwise known as MERS, as well as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, otherwise known as SARS, which we had uh, an epidemic recently. The most recently discovered coronavirus causes the coronavirus disease, which we talked about earlier, which is when COVID-19. Reported illnesses have ranged from mild symptoms to severe illnesses and death for confirmed coronavirus diseases. These symptoms may appear, what we say is the incubation period, uh, two to 14 days after exposure. However, we have seen cases uh, averaging somewhat longer or somewhat shorter. That's why it's important to think about the quarantine period that, that your physician may give you if you are possibly exposed to someone with the coronavirus. Other th symptoms that are common are fever, cough, or shortness in breath. And I do want to point out, if you have any of these symptoms, it's extremely important and paramount to contact your health care provider immediately if you are experiencing any of the above symptoms. Next slide, please. So it's important to figure out and also to know how this virus spreads. If we're going to contain and mitigate the virus, one needs to know how it spreads in order to stop it from spreading. There is currently no vaccine to prevent the coronavirus in 2019, uh, have a, in 2020 as well. And Dr. Skolnick will talk about the current process and the current trials and investigations undergoing for vaccines for, for the novel coronavirus. The best way that we know to prevent this illness currently is to avoid being exposed to this virus. This virus is thought to spread mainly from person to person contact between people who are in close contact with one another within about six feet Hence the reason why social distancing, which we'll talk about momentarily, is extremely important during the pandemic. It is thought to spread through what we call respiratory droplets, which are produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby or possibly be inhaled into the lungs. These droplets can also land on, on surfaces and can last for several hours and even up to several days, depending upon the surface that it lands upon. Next, please. So how may one protect yourself and others? Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after you have been in a public place or after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing. If soap and water, which is ideal, is not readily available, please use a hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Cover all surfaces of your hands and rub them together until they feel dry. Please avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth with unwashed hands. Reason being is that you may have touched something that could be contaminated with coronavirus. And if you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, there's a good possibility that you can self-inoculate uh, with the virus causing you to become infected and, and ill. Please avoid contact with people who are sick. That's why it's extremely important that if you are sick, please stay home and don't report to work. Uh, please avoid contact with people who are sick. And currently, we're doing something called social distancing. Please put distance between yourself and other people if the COVID-19 is spreading in your community, which we are, are very well aware that it is here currently, especially in our backyard here in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Stay home if you're sick. That's one of the best pieces of advice that we can get. Uh, if you are sick, please stay home, take care of yourself, and please get medical care to help you through these times. Please cover your mouth and nose with a tissue when you cough or sneeze, or use the inside of your elbow and what we call the vampire technique. Throw those used tissues in the trash. Please don't lay, leave them around on the counter so as other people can pick them up and possibly get infected with the virus. Next slide, please.
to conclude, I wanted to give you a couple slides from the CDC. These, these are some, some recommendations and some informational sheets that one may take home or print out and bring to their workplace. Uh, these are just some FAQs and fact sheets that are readily available to the public to download what you need to know about the coronavirus disease. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these because uh, Dr. Uh, Kravitz will go through quite a few of these as well in his talk. Uh, but these are basic information. It's how does it spread? Has there been any cases in the U.S.? What are some of the symptoms, uh, complications? How may I protect yourself? Things that we already went over uh, in, in some detail. Next slide. And to conclude, I wanted to leave you with how to stop the spread of germs. This not only applies to coronavirus, this applies to any germs that you can encounter. Please be mindful that even though the topic of, of the day is coronavirus, we are still in the influenza season. Um, so it's very important to help spread the respiratory illnesses like COVID as well as influenza. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Cover your cough or, or sneeze with a tissue. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth clean and disinfect, frequently touch objects and services, stay home when you are sick, except to get medical care. And please, the most important thing is wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. With that, I'll end my discussion. I thank you for your time and I'm passing on to my colleague, Dr. Kravitz. All right, uh, hello everyone. <clears throat> uh, Alex, am I up and running here? Uh, my name is Joel Kravitz. I've been an emergency medicine physician now for almost half my life, actually. Um, first thing um, I wanted to talk about uh, was, if Alex, you can go to the next slide. And the next one after that. We're going to cover some things that are great, not so great. First thing I wanted to say was thank you to everybody, uh, not only to the TBSP for putting this together, but for the public at large, uh, who's really come out and support us. Um, I, I don't think I've ever been this popular in my entire life because um, my job has finally come a little bit to the forefront of, of really what, you know, what we do. Um, this is my standard attire for an average day's work. I don't look particularly good in yellow, but that's what we have. But just so you understand what, what all of us in the emergency room are going through, um, what you're seeing here is a, um, I actually have two protective visors and my glasses, which are not really official protection, and then a glass visor that's over my face right there. What you're seeing are two masks. The one on the front is a surgical mask. That's a standard surgical mask that everybody talks about. Underneath that one, I have an N95 mask, which is a, you know, the respirator mask that we use to prevent small particles from going through because the regular mask doesn't really protect uh, you from inhaling particles. The reason we do that is because actually most places are short on supplies and we don't have enough N95 respirator masks to go around. So we end up reusing them. Um, and then I have my gown and my gloves. I will say that this is actually not considered the optimal protection that we would use. Now, on the flip side of that, I will say I'm a lot more fortunate than a lot of my colleagues around the country. You know, my slides are, are I think I made them two or three days ago, and they're already horribly out of date with everything that's happened in the last two days. If you watch the news at all, you've heard stories about some of my colleagues in New York City who are actually using garbage bags to protect themselves. So the supply chain is really a problem here. But for all of you who are staying home and helping not spread the disease, we all in the emergency medicine community and in the hospitals, we all thank you. Uh, can we just go to the next slide, Alex? All right. Yeah, uh, it's a tough time to be an R doctor. I don't think uh, anyone would <laughs> argue that right now. I will say, and, uh, and I think Dr. Rosemont could probably agree with me, in 25 years, this might be one of the worst flu seasons we've seen in a long time. Usually the flu is either really severe but not as widespread or it's very widespread and not as bad this is a very unique season we've had a really bad flu season where it's been widespread and really severe so we got piled on with this right at the same time the flu season is still right at the tail end of it so we're still seeing flu through the community and this came on top of it on top of that the usual problems that would bring people to the emergency room haven't exactly gone away people still come to the er for strokes and heart attacks and and cutting their, their hand and breaking their leg and everything else. So I'm a member of a couple of uh, groups, uh, Facebook groups and other, other groups of ER doctors around the country. And I will tell you straight, no matter what you read from, P you know, saying who has the appropriate PPE, there is almost no ER in the country right now that is thoroughly adequately prepared for what either they have now or what is to come. 
Um, nobody has enough PPEs to last. They may get it through a little bit of time, but not all of them. And in fact, the reason I wrote bandanas there is that the CDC has actually issued a recommendation that if you run out of regular surgical masks, they recommend using bandanas, which I will tell you flat out does not protect you against anything. Almost no ER has enough isolation beds or ventilators. Uh, if you watch the news, you know these things. And the other thing, and this, this last point isn't really a critique on anyone, there's really no place that has stable guidance. The guidelines on what to do change in the middle of my shift. At least they did at the beginning. They're a little bit more stable now. But we are, I think, as a medical community, running to catch up. So when a lot of people ask us questions, the most common thing that we say is we honestly don't know. To put this in perspective, uh, the flu, I mean, we have 150 years of data on the flu, mortality rates, how quickly it spreads, who it goes to. You have to keep in mind that this disease, this condition is five months old. That's probably about the time that you would need to put together a decent trial of something, let alone understand the disease. So the amount of knowledge that we have in just five months is actually pretty incredible. But it really just changes all the time. Uh, next slide, if we could. All right, so this is you know, the typical COVID symptoms, and this is right off the CDC website. Dr. Rosenbaum had it on his slides as well. Uh, within two to 14 days after exposure, you will present with fever or cough or shortness of breath, which is great information, but unfortunately that loosely covers probably more than a third of what I see in the ER right now. If you have the flu, you have that. If you have COVID, you have that. If you have pneumonia, you have that. If you have COPD and you have bronchitis, you look like that. Um, so this is a lot of people. So trying to separate the, the wheat from the chaff, if you will, and trying to figure out who's COVID and who isn't is a challenge. And what we do is we just assume everybody has it um, and then figure it out from there to protect ourselves as well as other patients. Um, next slide, if you would. So a few trends, and none of these things are written in stone, but these are things you should probably know about these conditions, and they change. Uh, first of all, nasal congestion and sneezing is less likely to be seen in COVID. Um, that's usually seen like an upper air, upper respiratory disease, like a common cold, if you will. You don't really see that with these with uh, with coronavirus. Likewise, for sore throat, it's a less common symptom. Can you get it with it? Yes. It just trends less like that. Uh, generally speaking, flu is more rapid. If you've ever had the flu, the flu hits you pretty quick. Once you have it within about 24 hours, you feel like you've been hit by a train. COVID takes a couple more days. That said, um, the ones that I've seen who have um, deteriorated. Once they deteriorate, they deteriorate very quickly. But they will have symptoms for a few days before that. Um, diarrhea was originally thought to be less common in, uh, in COVID-19. And actually, one of the strains of flu that's been out this year has actually had a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms. So we were really operating on an assumption that diarrhea was a common symptom of the flu and almost unheard of for coronavirus. That's starting to change now, where we're seeing some people with abdominal symptoms. Now, I will also say uh, the stuff that we've seen in the past uh, few weeks, maybe a month, to give you an idea how quickly this changes, it's so variable. And we've, we've had people who've come in with, you know, shoulder pain, and then they mention, oh, I had a mild cough. We check their temperature, it's 103, and they have coronavirus. So there, we've had people walk in with nothing and have it. Um, and that's kind of just, that's the job, I guess. Um, next slide. So people always ask me, what should make me come to the emergency department? And I, I give all these lists. The one rule that I think is probably the best one to follow is this. If coronavirus never existed, if you never even heard COVID-19, if it didn't exist, would your symptoms be bad enough to make you come to the emergency department? And I think if the answer is yes, yeah, you should come and see us. If it's not, then treatment at home is probably the way to go. But I think, you know, with all the the, the minutia of the symptoms, I think that's probably the best single rule I could give um, as to how to make those decisions. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so this is uh, data from March 20th and March 24th, and this data is already woefully behind. But I want to draw a couple of tensions here. Some of the stuff is really horrible to listen to, and some is actually not too bad, and let me walk you through it. So March 20th, we have 255,000 cases worldwide, 10,000 deaths. And the U.S., you see those numbers there. The U.S. mortality rate there is about 1.2%, a little bit lower than was reported in China, a little bit lower, obviously lower than been reported in places like Italy or Spain. Fast forward four days, 
And worldwide is 395,000 cases with 17,000 deaths. There are the US numbers. The US numbers there are also a mortality rate of 1.2%. The, and by the way, if we fast forward from the 24th just to today, two days later, those numbers are already much higher. And the mortality rate is really probably not too far off. I think if the numbers are right, it's about 1.5%, about 65,000 cases and just about 1,000 deaths. My math might be a little off. One thing I wanted to mention, the, the stuff that is scary, and then I'll get to the good stuff. It took the world three months to get the first 100,000 cases. It took the world about three weeks to a month to get the next 100,000 cases. And as you can see there, about three days to get the third 100,000 cases. And from March 24th to today, two days, another 100,000 plus cases. So it is spreading. It's not a travel spread, it's community spread. It's already everywhere. Now that's the bad news. Here's the good news. If you look at these numbers, and I didn't include the cases that have been resolved here, you know, yes, it's horrible that people die of this disease. It's horrible that die, people die of any disease. But the drive home point here is that most people will do very well here. They end up with a mild illness. They end up with a mild flu-like illness. It's most people do not have severe disease. Thank you. You beat me to it. So most people will have next to nothing or a cold-like illness or flu-like illness. And, you know, that's about 80% to 85% of people will do very well. So in the midst of all these scary numbers, it's important to understand that most people will get through it, heal up fine, recover, and go on. And that's, I guess, good news, if there is good news in all this. Uh, next slide, if you would. I just want to give an example patient, because I want to talk about testing here. Um, because everybody asks, you know, should I get a test? How do I do it? So I want to use an example patient that this is someone that, that a typical patient that I've seen. So. It's a 72 year old man. He lives at home with his wife. He's been isolated. He visits New York for his wife's cancer treatment. So in the last month or so, he's been there a couple of times, just into the hospital and out. That's it. No sightseeing, no nothing. He's been home. He's been doing it right. He's been short of breath and he's been weak for about three days. But now he's at the point that he really can't walk more than 30 feet without getting short of breath. And this is a pretty healthy 72 year old man. He has some high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and that's it. Um, probably better shape than most of us. Uh, he has a mild dry cough, no runny nose. He hasn't traveled. His temperature was 101 at home. It was about 99 and a half when I saw him. His x-ray showed the disease on both sides of the lungs. Usually with a pneumonia, you would see a focal disease on one, one lobe of one lung on the x-ray, but he had it on both lungs, and his flu test is negative. Next slide. All right. So do you order a test for this gentleman? So the one thing you need to understand about tests, and I know there are a lot of physicians on the line, and they understand most of this, but for those of you who don't, just want to walk you through some of these issues and we're going to get to some of them in the questions as well first of all does testing change your management or alter treatment so most doctors would agree it, if you're not going to change what you do based on a test most of the time it may not be necessary to order the test since you already have the plan set up unless it's going to change things um, can testing be achieved rapidly right now most coronavirus tests are at best 24-hour turnaround now there are some University labs that have achieved rapid turnarounds in the matter of an hour to four hours, but those are not commercially readily available. Uh, is the test easily available? Uh, I will tell you both of my colleagues and myself, um, no. In fact, we restrict our testing in the hospitals to the sickest patients and only those people who are being admitted. Now, the flip side of this is something that I think, you know, Seth could speak to is does the testing serve a higher purpose? In other words, are you testing for the purposes of surveillance? Are you trying to see how much disease is out in the community and then use that to guide public health treatment? So that is a role for treatment. Um, next slide. So testing in New Jersey, I, I, like I said, it is limited access to tests in hospitals uh, reserved for the severest of cases or what we call a person under investigation or a PUI. For example, that gentleman who I admitted was considered a person under investigation. He got admitted, he got a coronavirus test. And I'll tell you, I have no idea what his result is yet because the turnaround is long. It's at least four to five days for most tests, unless they're doing it in house. And there are, even that has only a small batch of tests that they can do. And they don't do those for the average walk in. And this is the one thing that I think most of you know, but should be said, I'll just say it straight. Don't come to the ER to be tested. We just don't do routine testing there. We have people, by the way, we're a month more into this. And I have people still come and they say, I just want to get tested. And we're going, I'm sorry, we just don't do that. Um, now, I'll tell you how to do it. If you think you need a test, you can talk to, as Dr. Rosenbaum said, 
talk to your uh, primary care physician, call your doctor, um, or you can call the local Department of Health. The New Jersey number here is 1-800-222-1222, which by the way is also the poison control number, but uh, the Department of Health has uh, co-opted this for um, purposes of this pandemic. And they have an algorithm through which they can tell you, yes, we think you should be tested and can guide you to the nearest place to do it. Next slide. As far as treatment goes, um, we're, gonna, we're coming up on the end here. For most people, it's a home remedy. It's rest and fluids and Tylenol. Uh, I've had a couple of people ask me, uh, what about ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil? So for those of you who, who know, they're all the same thing. People say, oh, I heard that, that ibuprofen is, is very bad. Uh, you really should not take it if you have uh, coronavirus. There have been some recommendations to avoid it. Uh, notably, the World Health Organization has made a recommendation. Uh, some data out of France suggested this. So basically, theoretically, ibuprofen can suppress the immune response. And yes, they have seen some more disease, some more severe disease, I should say, in smaller groups. That said, there has not really been a large amount of controlled evidence to support this. So I would say, that said, I would start with Tylenol for fever or symptom control. If that's not working and you are otherwise healthy, in other words, you don't have any kind of immunosuppressive disease or asthma or something that might be triggered by a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, Motrin should not be an issue as a second option for most people. Next slide. All right, I want to talk about um, a couple of things. I mentioned chloroquine here, and I'm going to go on something else too. So chloroquine, it's been in the news, and people talk about it. So here's the good news about the coronavirus, uh, chloroquine rather. It has shown promise in prior viral outbreaks, the SARS epidemic. It has been touted as having broad-spectrum antiviral response. So there is some antiviral effect to chloroquine, that's true. That said, people have said, oh, it's been around a long time, it won't kill anybody. That is absolutely untrue. Um, it is toxic in the wrong dose, lethal in the wrong doses. And if anyone's been following the news, uh, there was a story of a couple in Arizona who heard the news about chloroquine and took chloroquine phosphate, which was an antiparasitic for their aquarium. Um, he died and she's in critical care in Arizona. So they clearly did not get uh, appropriate medical advice. Um, the bad news about chloroquine, or I say that it's not bad necessarily, is that success with SARS was never formally tested. Once they used it for a few patients in SARS, there were never large scale tests to see if it was truly a good antiviral. Every expert around um, from infectious disease to emergency medicine to public health would all say that it requires further testing. It does have significant side effects. It can cause dizziness and blurred vision, but more importantly, it can actually cause significant cardiac side effects and arrhythmias, particularly when combined with other heart medications or even some antibiotics. So the bottom line for that is I wouldn't expect its use in the short term and your doctor, frankly, shouldn't be prescribing it to you because there's just no evidence for it. Just don't switch the slides for one second. I, there's one other thing I wanted to mention, which I, like I said, things have changed so rapidly. I didn't get a chance to put this on the slide. There's a lot of stuff that's come out in the last day or so about vitamin C uh, and taking a large dose of vitamin C as treatment for coronavirus. Um, vitamin C has been used to try to treat sepsis or advanced infections and organ failure from these infections in the past. There is some data that suggests that it's promising um, there hasn't been any data that says, you know, drinking four gallons of orange juice is going to make you feel better or buying all the vitamin C at shop or at the CVS or whatever is going to make you better. That, that's not established yet. Um, but in case someone had that question, I thought I'd at least mention that. Um, I think my last slide is a good way to look at social distancing um, explained by Candy. And I want to thank my wife for this one. So let me put it to you simply. If somebody gave you a bag of 100 Skittles, and I'll take this a step further. If somebody gave you a bag of 100 Skittles and said, you can have all you want but two of the Skittles are lethal, and about 13 of them will land you in the critical care unit of your local hospital, would you eat them? No, you would just not eat Skittles until you knew they were safe. Social distancing is basically the same thing. You could go out, you know, you think you're perfectly healthy and fine, but is it worth that chance? I think in our current state, probably not. And we can talk about public health issues, which we'll probably talk about in the Q&A, but I thought that was a nice, simple way of explaining why we should just unfortunately, stay away from each other right now. Um, I thank you for your time, and I'll hand it over to uh, Jess Coleman. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Joel, and thanks uh, for everybody for joining us uh, and to the TBS community really for sponsoring this and for permitting us to provide this information to you. Um, so if we move to the next, you know, my hope is to give you a little bit of information in terms of what vaccine development is really all about. 
So we can move to the next slide. And, you know, there's a real question, obviously, as to what can we do when we're faced with something that we want to treat, we feel like we should be able to, and yet the therapy is so far away from us, it seems. People are asking, why do we not yet have a vaccine for COVID-19? So let's take a step back and just very basic, and again, uh, as we've said, there are physicians on the call, but, you know, it's good to remind ourselves, what do vaccines do? So the most important thing to know about vaccines is that they are preventative. They're stimulating the body's immune system or the body's defenses in order to protect against, in this case, infections. That might be a bacteria or it might be a virus like the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the vaccines are really designed to make your body feel as if it is being attacked by this foreign invader without physically attacking it with the virus or bacteria. You can make vaccines out of pieces of protein, pieces of carbohydrates or sugars, and these tend to be lookalikes so that our vaccines are really built to look like pieces of bacteria, pieces of proteins expressed by the virus. And the vaccines are then revving up your immune system so that you can activate your defense system. And why would you wanna do that? Well. When you then see this real offending virus or real offending bacteria, now your body's been instructed what to do. It has a fantastic memory when it sees viruses, bacteria in general, that it's seen before. And that memory allows it now to really create an appropriate response. So instead of getting sick, you are generating an immune response to the offender. And one of the reasons why vaccines are so effective is because they're generating this immune response without making you sick. So you're really being prevented from becoming sick. Vaccines are not new. The first vaccine arguably was discovered in about 1796. And so we really do have centuries of science behind vaccine development. Next, please. So Dr. Kravitz was talking a little bit about chloroquine. And I wanted to just explain the difference between vaccines and therapeutics. And at its core, vaccines prevent. The real goal of a vaccine is to keep you from getting sick. There are certain vaccines that are also therapeutic. But in the case of COVID-19, we're looking at generating vaccines that keep you from getting sick in the first place. That's very different than, for example, chloroquine or an antibiotic that's a therapeutic to treat you when you get sick. And when we talk in a few moments about the companies that are developing both vaccines and therapeutics, you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of research that's being done on both fronts, not just in the treatment, but also potentially in the prevention of. Next, please. So there is this core question as to why on earth does it take so long? And why is it taking us so long to make a vaccine for COVID-19? And as you heard Dr. Kravitz say, we really have only had several months of knowledge of this particular coronavirus. We knew about SARS, we knew about MERS, and we know about coronaviruses in general. But this particular coronavirus, we only have months of information. If you take a look at the timelines in general to generate a new vaccine, you're talking about 12 years. It takes a tremendous amount of time to develop new drugs, but specifically new vaccines. And I'll mention why in just a moment. We're really hoping, if we go back, thank you, we're really hoping though that we can do this within two years. So you may have heard uh, some of our uh, lawmakers, for example, government officials, uh, members of the NIH and of the CDC, and also individuals who are now developing these preventative medicines that we anticipate having a vaccine within 12 to 18 months. So 18 months would be about two years from when we first identified this virus. And that would probably be one of the shortest timelines ever seen to generate a vaccine. So why does it take so long? So the first thing you need to do is you need to physically design what it is that you are going to give to people, and then you need to make it. You need to test it on non-humans. That's usually, for example, mice, 
it may be rabbits, it may be non-human primates. That takes at least a year, plus or minus. Then we need to test it in humans in what we call phase one trials. These tend to be very small, and they are really initial looks at whether or not the drug product or vaccine is safe. We rarely can even ask questions as to whether or not they work in these first phase one studies. In the case of COVID-19, we are going to try to do that to speed up the process. Once we understand about safety and tolerability, we ask now, does it work in a phase two trial? That can take years. And then finally, in a large, usually randomized phase three study, which may have hundreds, if not thousands of patients, we ask the real question, does this particular vaccine work better than, for example, a placebo, salt water, or a sugar pill? Then the FDA has to approve this new therapeutic that takes six months to a year. And there is then ample safety data that will come in the years that follow. So you can see that even as you try to short circuit this process to create literally in months a new vaccine, it technically should take years to get a new vaccine to people. And one of the biggest challenges for vaccine development is that as opposed to often the way drug development works, where we're giving a therapeutic to sick patients, with vaccines, we're giving something to healthy people to keep them from being sick. So that means that the safety and the tolerability of a new vaccine is really, really important. It cannot show any real side effects in order to be introduced into a healthy patient or subject population. Next, please. So, you know, the question then obviously is how do we go faster? And again, as we've said, we are going pretty fast. The vaccines that are generated for SARS-CoV-2 are based upon what's called the S protein or the spike protein of the coronavirus. And thankfully, there's similarity across S proteins in uh, coronavirus in general. And so scientists can use this particular information to speed up their vaccine development. In fact, we've been able to speed up vaccine development instead of, as we've said, months to years to get animal data. We can do that in weeks and to get into the clinic to first test humans in safety studies, we've gone from instead of years to months. One of the other most helpful pieces of developing this particular vaccine was that early on, China shared the genome, the DNA of the virus itself, that tells us how this S protein is encoded for, basically the language of the or DNA or the genes in which proteins are spelled out, they told us what this viral genome looked like, and that allows us to build a better vaccine against the spike protein. I can tell you from personal experience that people are working on developing vaccines around the clock. There are individuals, for example, at my company who I know personally have not slept in weeks. So, you know, like Dr. Kravitz, who is quite literally on the front line, these folks are also trying to do their best to try to make it so that we can get a vaccine as soon as possible. FDA has agreed to expedite, in certain cases, the review of documents that will allow the process of getting these vaccines tested and ultimately, and hopefully, to the public faster. And of course, as you know, as recently as within the last 24 hours, the government has now committed trillions to this, previously billions, but hopefully we now have the resource to do this. Next, please. So, um, single slide, if you move to the next. So I just wanted to show you, as it were, um, what coronavirus COVID-19 looks like. So these are the first 5,000 base pairs, if you move back one. So what you're looking at uh, previously, if we just go back one slide. Thank you. So, um, that image is of the first 5,000 what we call base pairs of the virus itself. So you see a lot of letters, A's, T's, G's, C's. That's essentially what builds the virus protein. That's what China was able to share with us and what's enabling us to build our vaccines. That's it. What you're looking at 
is causing tens of thousands of people to get sick and die and hundreds of thousands of people to be sickened. Just that. It's just a bunch of letters. And we're really trying our hardest to generate the right medicines to fight just that that's on your screen. So the entire genome is longer. It's just a snippet of it. So now if we do move forward, we'll talk about who is developing both vaccines and therapeutics. And as you may have seen on the next slide, it was extremely exciting news that came out of Boston from Moderna, a biotech company uh, that's in the Cambridge area, designing RNA-based medicines, RNA-based vaccines. They dosed their first patient, the first human trial of a COVID-19 vaccine on the 16th of March on the West Coast in the Pacific Northwest. It was a very exciting time. Actually, Moderna was able to do that quite literally in two and a half months from the laboratory to the clinic and get a patient a novel vaccine. It will still take the 12 to 18 months before we know whether or not this is appropriate for everyone. But the fact that they were able to do that in literally weeks to months, that's a real paradigm shift. That's a real change. You're also seeing companies, for example, like Gilead, who are using antiviral treatments different antiviral treatments that they may have used for other types of illnesses. Again, you may have seen that they had an Ebola therapy, a remdesivir, that they're now trying for COVID-19. Again, the thought with antiviral treatments or therapeutics in general is that we can either develop new or even repurpose things that we know can fight viruses and bacteria, take them off the shelf and try them but it still takes an appropriate amount of time to ask the question as to whether or not they're safe and tolerable, and more importantly, whether or not they work, as Dr. Kravitz said before. Pulling chloroquine out of your aquarium shelf is not a way to treat coronavirus. So the companies that you see on your screen, Abby, Eli Lilly, Gilead, GSK, my company at Inovio, J&J, &J. again, we've mentioned the success that Moderna has had, Pfizer and Regeneron, Sanofi, Veer Biotech, and there are now literally dozens of others that are testing antiviral therapies, building vaccines, and really trying to get new medicines into the clinic and then to our larger patient populations so that we really can avoid this disease. Next. So I'll turn it back over and to Alex, and we can start questions. All right. First, I want to thank Jeffrey and Joel and Seth for their presentations and their work in, uh, in putting this together. Uh, we do have a number of questions here. And one thing I just want to say, and you've seen some disclaimers fly around here, but just to be clear, you know, if you have uh, questions or, or concerns about your own health from this, um, we hope this is informational, but it is not an excuse to uh, not call your physician, to call your doctor, and to get specific advice from them in terms of uh, where to go. So uh, we're happy to help provide some information, but we are not diagnosing anyone tonight. Uh, maybe we'll meet back in person. So the first set of uh, coronavirus questions that we have are, are around testing. Um, and we heard a bit about the testing, but um, this first one, I think it's going to go to you, uh, Dr. Kravitz, to Joel, and it's about um, at-home testing. Um, for the, as the questioner said, for the worried well, um, people who are, uh, have some mild symptoms perhaps, and they'd like to just be, uh, like to know if they have it or not, and also we've heard about asymptomatic carriers of, uh, of coronavirus. Um, are, are the at-home tests effective, um, and is that something that, uh, that you'd uh, recommend doing if they, if they are, and if so, how could one get that? Uh, okay, so um, when I got the question, I looked at it. A couple, another question is: so before we get to that, uh, someone asked, uh, "Can you have coronavirus and test negative?" That's the first question. So, in other words, what's the point of getting the test if there's a possibility that I'm going to get the test and it's going to be negative anyway? So, there's not a whole lot of data. I mean, Jeff and Seth could both back me up on this, I think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. But there are tons of companies out there with different types of tests and different types of reagents. So it's hard to gauge exactly what the gold standard of a coronavirus test is. That said, the data from China, the early testing said that the false negative rate was about 3%. In other words, if they did the test on you, 
there's a 3% chance that you would have the disease and it would be the negative test. Now, what causes a negative test? Well, truthfully, the more asymptomatic you are, the more likely you are to have a false negative test. The coronavirus, the swab literally goes, I'm gonna turn my head here, it goes, the swab goes up the nose and back here. So unless you have the disease in the upper part of that airway, if there's enough disease there, coughing, whatever it is, and they don't pick it up on the swab, well, you know, you're, you're gonna test negative. If this test is administered improperly, you'll probably test negative. Um, as far as the at-home tests, they exist. There was one company called, I'm not endorsing them, but there's one company called Carbon, and then one company, funnily, funnily enough, it's called Let's Get Tested. That's actually the name of the company. So the tests, for the most part, are um, about $150 to $120, and they'll send it to your house. And you can do the home test, which means you have to do it properly, which is all the way into the back, uh, and then you send it out. Now. These tests are actually very similar chemically to the tests that are run in, you know, uh, labs and hospitals. But because they're similar to those, they're sent out and they're run like the tests at the hospitals. So the turnaround time is still about, is a, still a couple of days. It's not a rapid test. So if you're looking for a home, like the version of a home pregnancy test where you can just test positive or negative, that doesn't exist. That doesn't even exist in the hospitals. Um, again, to go back to the original statement, if, what's the point of testing if it's not going to change what you do? If you're well and you still have to take care of a loved one, you're still going to practice the same hygienic practices you would otherwise. There's no reason not to do that. So I have to say, and unless Seth or Jeff uh, have an opinion otherwise, I actually wouldn't recommend the home tests because I don't know that the, the cost and the turnaround time gets the average person any mileage, if you will. Do you want to have something to add? Just to uh, add on to what Dr. Kravitz was saying, uh, you have to be careful with the home testing kits because testing that's available here in the United States is FDA approved. It goes through a rigorous testing cycle itself to make sure it's properly uh, manufactured. There is the liquid that's in the test, which is called the media, which needs to be three milliliters. Some of these test kits we found have not had the proper amount of reagent that's necessary for the labs to run the test. So just because you have this kit at home, you need to realize that not only do you have to do it properly and get the specimen, you have to send it to one of the commercially appropriate labs, such as LabCorp or Quest or some of the independent labs that you know in the area. You need to also to check with the lab that they would accept these, these, these home kits, because not all the labs would accept kits that were done by individuals, not healthcare providers. So a word of caution, like Dr. Kravitz said, when you are using home kits, if you so choose, uh, to make sure you're doing it properly, number one. Number two, it has the proper reagent in it. And number three, that the, t the, s the lab that you're going to be sending it to will accept it in the format that you're sending it to. Thank you. Okay. All right, this, uh, this next question, I think, is one that's uh, on a lot of people's minds now. This comes from Sue K. Levine, who's asking about pa Passover coming up. And uh, of course, it's hard to be away from family together away from family on Passover. Um, and she asked about her daughter, Cantor Sarah Levine, and about her coming home for the holiday. Um, what are your thoughts, and we'll direct this one to Dr. Rosenbaum, you know, about flying versus driving. Is it safe taking the trip or not taking the trip? And, and also ask you, you know, kind of about what about getting together for seders, even if people are, uh, are local is another question that we're getting quite a bit. Um, are there precautions people could take or, uh, or, or what do you think about travel right now? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's a very difficult question to ask. You know, of, you know, this time of year, we're all prepping for Pesach and we're doing our shopping if need be and we're getting everything ready. And the thought on our mind is, are we going to be able to be with our family and loved ones? Um, I do have to say that all the respected authorities, uh, whether it's the CDC, the WHO, or Dr. Fauci, all have come out with the recommendations that travel is not recommended at this time. Uh, it's, it's, we all know that everyone wants to be with their loved ones during the holidays. It's very difficult to say to try to social distance yourself or not be with your loved ones uh, during the holidays. Mm -hmm. But the recommendation that I feel uh, would be not to travel at this time uh, to avoid possible exposure. Uh, you know, social distancing is important to flatten this curve we've all heard about. 
uh, by being with loved ones in groups of 10 or more, or even with elderly folks or with immunocompromised folks really puts everybody at risk. Something we really want to try to avoid as difficult as it is to understand or comprehend at this time. Uh, they're all, they're, you know, we recommend alternative measures to try to, uh, uh, you know, continue to Seder in any way, shape or form. And I'll just add to that, um, the uh, Committee on the Jewish Law and Standards of uh, the Conservative Movement, of which I'm a member, just uh, today or yesterday, all these days kind of come together, um, released uh, you know, similar guidance and uh, trying to have uh, people stay where they are for the Seder and permitting um, video conferencing software like this, Zoom or FaceTime or something like that, to uh, meet up with families uh, for the holiday. And also there are a number of uh, leniencies in terms of uh, food, if that's something that's hard to get, uh, Passover food. Thankfully, in our area, um, that's pretty uh, plentiful at the moment, but if it becomes less so, some guidance there too. And that's something I'll just say from uh, TBS's perspective, we've been talking about a lot, and early next week, we'll be sending out uh, some information about ways in which we can uh, help uh, support people who, uh, who need support for Passover, if they're on their own, or if you help with food, or ways in which we can uh, try to connect, uh, even when we're physically distant, to uh, connect spiritually over the holiday, in addition to what we'll be doing at Shabbat and other times, uh, other times too. No, it's uh, one, really hard one, to keep saying. I wanted to add, if I could. Yeah, Joel, go ahead. So, it's funny, Seth and I talked about this question uh, yesterday. Um, so there's really two issues. Is the first one is, should you travel? And the answer, I agree with him. I agree with Dr. Rosal completely. The answer is probably not. Then the next question is, if you're going to travel. What would be the options? Because I know she said, was it, should she fly or drive? Um, I think depending on how far it is, I, again, if you're forcing us, and we talked about this, if you're forcing us to choose, I would probably choose flying. The reason I say that is because you're, first of all, very few people are flying. So there's some social distance built into the airline industry already due to lack of travel. Second, you know, if you're going to drive, you run into issues with, are the rest stops open if you have to stay overnight in a hotel for a long drive? So I think the, the less people you'll interact with would be achieved by flying. So for what that's worth, if you're forcing us to make a decision, it would be flying over driving, I would think, unless Jeff or Seth disagree. Okay. I just think at this time, it, the best motive, the best option is to really to limit travel at all, at all costs if you're able to do it, just to minimize the risk of exposure at this time. Correct. Um, okay, here's, a, here's another question. We've got a number of questions. Uh, well, let's, let's go to this one about some uh, pre-existing conditions. This is from John Everly. Uh, for people with autoimmune conditions, is there any clinical data on risk for them? And we know that they're high risk, but what exactly does that mean? Is it high risk? to an 80-year-old, a 70-year-old, high risk is it when we're talking about autoimmune conditions and uh, COVID-19? So um, the CDC and the WHO, as well as other respected authorities, have identified several risk factors or people that they uh, have stated are higher risk for acquiring uh, COVID-19. Some of the ones, obviously, as, as Rabbi said, you know, you know, age greater than 65 is definitely a, is, uh, up there. Uh, some of what we call in the medical field comorbidities or other conditions that, that put you at risk would be someone with what we call lung disease or chronic lung disease, such as mild to moderate uh, asthma, uh, predisposing you to acquiring it because you already have some damaged lung tissue. Uh, that we've also had some anecdotal data from China that shows those that have cardiac disease have also shown a significant increased risk of uh, acquiring disease and having a poor outcome as to those that don't have heart disease. Uh, one of the areas that we are very concerned about, and that goes back to the question initially of traveling to visit with loved ones and elderly folks, is the immunocompromised. Uh, we have to be careful with those that are undergoing cancer therapies or treatments for rheumatological conditions because their immune system has been weakened and puts them at higher risk to, to acquisition of the disease. So those are other individuals that are at higher risk uh, to acquire the disease. And if they do acquire a disease, uh, they have more likelihood of, of having a severe form of the disease as if someone who wouldn't have those comorbidities or pre-existing conditions. Yeah. I mean, the truth of the matter is, I mean, the, the most common answer I think most of us are going to give is, we don't really know. I mean, there's not enough data out there to say this disease is necessarily more at high risk than this disease or having lupus makes you 10 years more at risk. There's just not enough data there. 
you know, the general, what exactly what Seth said is absolutely true. But in terms of saying specifically, this does that to your risk numerically, I mean, nobody knows that yet. We're, we're not anywhere near that. All right, this question is for uh, Dr. Skolnick, um, and it comes from Philip Korth, who grew up at TBS, and he is also the Vice President of the Undergraduate Biothics Society at the University of Pittsburgh, a, <laughs> a proud Dr. Jeffrey Kramer Biothics Initiative graduate, I guess. Um, and uh, he wanted to ask, and you touched on this has been your presentation, but uh, he's, he, he wants a little more information, but if there's any research associated with the 2002 SARS outbreak that might be of use now for researching ways to combat COVID-19. Feels like there hasn't been much reporting about that. And since they're two strains of the same same species of coronavirus, he's curious if there's uh, any learning can be done one to the other. Yeah. So the, the shortest answer to that is yes. Um, as we said before, so both SARS and MERS are coronavirus um, strains, and you know every coronavirus is different. As you know, as we said earlier, as Seth said earlier, the common cold is caused by a coronavirus, and so. We have taken the knowledge that we've gained from uh, the SARS epidemic and then subsequently the MERS epidemic to very specifically design, again, our vaccines against the spike protein to mirror what we learned, thought we learned from both the SARS and MERS experience. So, you know, as Seth said earlier, that COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, the similarity is clear our company, others like us who have also worked in SARS and MERS, essentially were able to take pieces of their template, quite literally, off of the computer with, again, the genome from China and build these vaccines in a matter of hours to days. Uh, you may have heard Dr. Fauci say that the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases was able to turn around, again, its work within two weeks. And that was a specific result of being able to leverage what they knew about SARS and MERS. I think there's a, a deeper question, which is what have we learned about epidemic or pandemic preparedness? And there perhaps we haven't taken necessarily enough from SARS or MERS, but of course, you know, there the, the coronavirus is acting differently. Those were rapidly very fatal diseases, but the spread was limited. And Seth could certainly speak about this much better than I can. In the case of COVID-19, we're not seeing the same thing. So we have learned a tremendous amount in terms of vaccine development. We've been able to leverage that. I think now what we can learn is how do you approach epidemics or now pandemics like these? Thank you. Um, here are a few questions from some of our uh, physicians. Um, first question from uh, Dr. Lee Brooks, who uh, says he's seen uh, small images of uh, chest x-rays on his, on his iPhone, and it seems to look, and forgive my mispronunciation if I do this, it seems to be uh, interstitial rather than LVR. Okay, I'm a rabbi, not a doctor, what can I tell you? And he's wondering if that is correct, not my pronunciation, but if these uh, diagnoses <laughs> correct. And uh, if so, might there be an autoimmune component to the lung disease, and have steroids been helpful? All right, well, um, my medical is better, but your Hebrew is better. <laughs> uh, okay, so in terms of what you see on, on, on x-rays, um, leaving out the quality of an image on an iPhone, you know, the classic, uh, the, you know, the, some diseases have classic patterns on an x-ray. Pneumonia, for, for example, will have one area of one lobe, or possibly one whole lobe or one lobe of or one, you know, lobule of a lung that will show what we call consolidation in one area you can clearly identify. Uh, some other diseases uh, like chronic obstructive lung disease will have alveolar patterns because what happens is the disease in that case has to do with destruction of the lung tissue at the smallest level, the alveoli, which are the small little, almost like balloons that where the air exchange occurs. This is really more of an interstitial pattern. In other words, what you're seeing is it's like a viral type pattern for lack of a better way to describe it. And there's really no classic response here because well, it's five months of data and we haven't really seen that much of it. But what we're seeing typically is a bilateral interstitial pattern. In other words, the disease kind of weaves its way through the tissues itself, very much the same way that you would see with uh, influenza or with um, some other inflammatory lung diseases. 
is there an autoimmune component to it? Uh, honestly, I don't know that anybody knows that answer. Uh, and as far as steroids, no, there hasn't been any evidence that steroids are helpful, uh, except in those cases where steroids would be used for an asthmatic or someone with emphysema where the, where the steroids would be indicated anyway. I hope that answers that part of it. Um, another question from uh, Dr. Howie Sattel, one of our dentists. Um, asking if you can address the risk to the dental community, specifically doctors and their clinical staff face some precautions we can take to minimize risk. Yeah, so I'll take that question. Um, so one of the things that the American Dental Association recommended recently uh, during the outbreak is that all dental procedures or what they call elective procedures uh, be stopped at the current time for three weeks. Um, and that's, that's in, in in, in evaluation of the type of procedures that they do in dental offices, one of the things you have to realize is that this is a droplet type of uh, virus spread. So if someone's in close proximity within the six feet and they're performing a procedure which could potentially aerosolize the, the virus and allow you to inhale it, that, that puts you at a, at a significant risk for acquisition of the, of the illness. Uh, dental procedures such as, you know, routine dental cleaning could theoretically aerosolize the virus if it's colonized in your oral pharynx when one uses water or air to blow out or dry out the mouth. Uh, so that would put dentists as well as dental hygienists at risk for acquisition of the disease, hence the reason why uh, elective procedures for, uh, for dentists have been uh, postponed for the next uh, three weeks or uh, until further notice. Um. Great. Another, you know, another question, um, and this is from uh, Dr. Lori Winter, and this is going to uh, segue with, a, with another question I have. Uh, and she writes, infants seem to get infection but not, are not so sick. Is there anything we can learn from their immune response in order to develop novel therapies? And uh, with that, um, kind of in tandem with that, we also have a question um, about uh, pregnancy. If a, a woman is pregnant uh, and she contracts the virus, is the baby at risk? And is there a risk to the uh, pregnant woman as well or to the unborn child? Uh, Dr. Kravitz, do you want me to take this? Oh, I was offering that one to you first. I okay. So, you know, it's, that's a very uh, hot topic right now in the, in the community as well as in the medical world regarding uh, women that are pregnant as well as uh, uh, to children. I'll take the pregnancy one to begin with. Uh, there really isn't sufficient data yet to determine the risk of, of both the, 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 the patient as well as, as the fetus to um, the, the disease. It's still in its infancy, as Jeff talked about. Um, but we do know from prior uh, uh, studies that women that are pregnant are somewhat immunocompromised and are at risk for viral infections more so than most people. So one can extrapolate that since this is a viral infection that uh, one could be at more risk to developing the COVID-19 virus if they are pregnant. Uh, but the, we need more data. We need more time to evaluate that data to really give us a good understanding of the risks of both mother and child uh, at this time. And as far as pregnancy goes, there, there's sort of two questions that come up, I think. The first, and I don't know which side of this, this uh, the, the person was asking. The first one is for moms who are pregnant, let's say early on, does the virus pose any risk to the developing fetus? And uh, that answer is just no idea. Nobody knows yet. As far as does the baby contract coronavirus, there's not a lot of data either, but there is some limited data out of China. I think it was one series of nine mothers who had babies, and it doesn't seem they're transmitted in, u in utero. It seems that they develop coronavirus by virtue of proximity to mom who has coronavirus outside the womb. Now, again, very small, I mean, very small numbers. So I don't think we can uh, really say for sure anything from that, but that, that's sort of what we know now. It's really good. And I would just add, um, so in terms of, you know, and again, I, I would have both Seth and Jill who know more about this than I do, certainly in the front lines, in terms of perhaps why younger children are not seeing as severe uh, disease phenotype as it were, you know, we don't, we don't entirely know, but one of the things that we recognize from other coronavirus-based illnesses like SARS and MERS was a phenomenon called ADE, antibody-dependent enhancement, 
And what was thought to be the case in those individual diseases was that people who had been exposed to coronavirus similar to the illness they were experiencing were essentially primed to react to that illness and so often triggered an aggressive immune response. We have no idea if that's what's happening in adults for COVID-19, but there's at least a theory that says prior exposure to something that looks like the coronavirus causing COVID-19 could trigger a more severe type of illness. We just don't know enough yet. Thank you. Um, here's a question about uh, society, I guess, and HIPAA laws from Sherry and Sam Rabinowitz. It says, uh, we appreciate the HIPAA laws, but during this pandemic, tracing where people have been is critical. Isn't it fair to tell the local population where they have been, namely supermarkets, pharmacies, gas stations, et cetera? Um, with the majority of COVID-19 cases, COVID cases in Camden County come from Cherry Hill, why can't the officials notify us of places the infected have frequented? I'll just add, and some of you might have seen in, in Israel, they're doing something somewhat controversial in, uh, in terms of tracking phones of people who've tested positive for uh, COVID-19 in order to try to limit the, uh, the spread of that, uh, that outbreak, which of course raises all sorts of privacy issues, et cetera, but it's a more aggressive response than, uh, than we see here. Um, how, would you, uh, how would you respond to that? Um, and Seth, Joel, Jeffrey, whoever would like to take that one first. So I, um, when, when, when the individual is found to be positive for a coronavirus, um, it's, it's important to do what we call contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing is when we try to identify the person of, of interest or the patient that's positive and find out who they have come in contact with uh, to uh, assess their risk of exposure and what possible treatments are going to be. Uh, Rabbi Pelz talked about HIPAA, and HIPAA is very important because we, we're, we're not supposed to be sharing what we call protected information in our patients' information to people that aren't actually providing care to those patients to protect um, the sensitive information. Uh, that being said, you know, the, the State Department of Health as well as the local county Department of Health have the obligation of notifying people they feel have been affected uh, or people that have a higher risk of being affected due to exposure. Uh, they brought up the recent incident at Cherry Hill uh, High School. Uh, they notified uh, of us that, that the incident happened. Another reason why we don't like to notify everybody is because it can cause someone of a panic, it can cause some over testing and unnecessary uh, utilization of, of the healthcare system. Uh, but do, do, believe, do, do realize that they are, people are notified when they have had a risk of exposure, especially in large quantities. If you remember recently, we had the outbreak of measles disease. Uh, and there were several reports coming out from Newark Airport and other airports in our area. If you happen to travel on such and such date, you may have come in contact with a potential measles uh, uh, patient. So those are the times that the health departments, both county and state level, will notify people uh, of a possible risk of exposure. But you have to be mindful of HIPAA, which is especially important in these times. Yeah, the other way to look at it is, Again, it brings up an issue about testing as well. Uh, you know, we've done, I mean, despite whatever you hear on TV, proportional to the population, we have not done nearly enough tests to satisfy the public health requirements. And that's a discussion for another time. That said, I think it's probably a conservative estimate to assume, and Seth and Jeff can neither tell me I'm wrong, or, but that it's, and we have anywhere from five to 10 times the number of cases of coronavirus out in the community, i.e. in the country, than we have diagnosed by virtue of testing. I think that's probably safe to assume. That said, and then if, you know, that, as some people find that terrifying, but the reality is you should probably operate as though everywhere you go may have had someone exposed to coronavirus. Now, that doesn't mean you wrap yourself in saran wrap when you go to go get food, but you should, what I mean is that you should always be mindful of what you need to do to protect yourself, whether it's hand sanitizer, wash your hands when you get home, whatever it is, you should just always operate on that assumption for now, leaving out the public health issue part. Uh, I, I think that that's probably the way to think about it as far as telling you where an individual has been all the time is, first of all, I think an unbelievably daunting task. And I don't know that it gets you that much more mileage than simply just operating 
cognizantly all the time. And, and we do, uh, well, on that, since you mentioned it, we do have a, had a couple questions on uh, going to the grocery store and, and opening mail and packages and things like that. What are your, uh, your thoughts about uh, the precautions that should be taken in, uh, in doing those everyday things? Um, well, I mean, I'll go first and then Seth can correct me if I'm wrong and Jeff too. Um, the virus has been documented to live on surfaces. Now the type of surface affects how long it lives. You know, one of the first things that everybody was worried about is, can I still pick up my Amazon package outside my door? Um, and the truth is that I think the virus can live up to about a, two days. I might be off by a little bit and correct me if I'm wrong, two days on cardboard. It can live a lot less on a more solid surface, like a metal or, or certain plastics. Uh, so essentially by the time you get your package, um, it's, you have nothing to worry about. Um, even Amazon Prime uh, isn't faster than coronavirus. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, so I think it's probably wise to just, when you pick up a package or get your mail or anything like that, you're probably safe. You really probably are. Now, if you're picking up something like, if you're picking up takeout from a restaurant, let's say, and that's a discussion from another time, you know, when you pick up the bag or whatever it is, when you're bringing it home, you may want to just take it out, put it on your own plate, hand sanitize, wash your hands, do whatever after you've gotten rid of the, the paper. Because again, the time frame is different. There. I don't know if Seth or Jeff have a different perspective. Yeah, so, um, you know, studies have shown, you know, with the recent outbreak on the, of the coronavirus on the, on the Princess cruise ships, they actually did studies uh, several days, or even weeks, to uh, after uh, all the passengers have left the ship. Uh, and they actually took random samples of doorknobs, of handles, as well as bedposts. And despite, you know, uh, you know weeks uh, afterwards, they still found some viral particles on those, on those surfaces. So to Joel's point is that studies have shown that certain uh, surfaces are, 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 are able to uh, resist the coronavirus for longer periods of time. Uh, you know, some are, are, are better of it, some are worse. Uh, some of the surfaces are like copper and steel and cardboard and plastic. Those are the ones that are most commonly studied at this time. That being said, I just have to say you need to just use some common sense when dealing with things. Uh, it goes back to basic hand hygiene. If you touch something, you want to put it down after you touch it and put it away. You want to wash your hands with soap and water or if you have hand sanitizer by it. That doesn't go for just the coronavirus. That goes for you know, anything, uh, even before the coronavirus, we should really be practicing good hand hygiene because that's one of the number one ways we have to prevent the spread of germs. Just to, and Seth, you can correct this part of wrong. before we in introduce an entire panic, my understand, I guess we're having a discussion between the two of us, but my understanding was that those studies, when they picked up those pieces of viral particles, they were not live virus at that point. So right. th there's a distinction between what could you touch that could get you sick and how long can the viral particles actually live somewhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they found those things on the, the, the Princess cruise ships, but they were no longer live virus. In other words, touching that handle at that point would not get you ill, but it was still there on some remnant form. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Good. All right, here's a question and also thinking about social distancing. Um, there was a piece uh, that Dr. David Katz of Yale and the True Health Initiative wrote the New York Times a few days ago that was entitled, Is Our Fight Against Coronavirus Worse Than the Disease? Uh, and in it, he argues that there may be a more, a more targeted way to address the pandemic that doesn't require those not in the vulnerable categories to remain home and be as fearful, which creates not only economic havoc, but also might prevent someone who has another condition to go to the hospital. Um, how would you respond to, uh, to, to what he wrote? And how would you respond to what he, what he wrote? Seth, you wanna start or Joel? I'll let Joel, go ahead. I, I actually, yeah, I, I read this one day. I was in the, uh, I was working in the ER and I had nothing else to do. So I read it. Um, so I'll say this, you know, some of what he says is correct and some I, I have a problem with. So I, I jotted down some notes, so I'm going to look down. I apologize. So some of the things he says is that what this has basically shown us is that we have a resource constrained, fragmented and perennially underfunded public health system. Yes, I don't think we can argue that point. He says that the social, economic, and public health consequences are gonna be long lasting, calamitous, and probably graver than the direct effect of the virus itself. 
He might be right. That's, that, that may actually be true. Um, he m brought up the point that he talked about, when is it safe for people to go back to the workforce, particularly older people or those people at risk? Like if you have asthma or you're a lung transplant patient, can you go back to your job at a law firm or a bartender? It's a good question. You know, maybe a 20 year old feels fine with that. Maybe a 65 year old person doesn't. Very good question. Uh, and he did focus on testing, he talked about testing people to see who was safe to go back out into the workforce. Yeah, he's right. That's the way we should do it. But we can't. Um, so the truth of the matter is we simply right now in the United States do not have the resources to test on a scale that was seen in in South Korea proportional to their population. We just haven't hit that mark. Uh, we just haven't. What he's saying makes sense. Um, we just can't do it. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to, to look at it. For example, if we could do blood tests on everybody who's had the disease, check them for immunoglobulins, which would be a marker of, you know, either active infection or recovery and say, okay, if you have these immunoglobulins in your bloodstream and you don't have symptoms, you are effectively immune and you are cleared to go back to work and then gradually reintroduce everybody into the workforce. That part would make sense. But his article sort of said, it, what it didn't address was, even if you're protecting those people at highest risk, which are you know the elderly and, and respiratory diseases and cardiac, we talked about all that. He doesn't really talk about what do you do about those people who live with those people? Mm -hmm. Do you quarantine them as well because they're living with someone who's at risk? And that doesn't answer the question. So he does make a point uh, in that, yes, the, the, the treatment of this may be worse than the disease itself in some, pers in some aspects. The other thing he should, uh, that I disagreed with was there was a, a talk about, you know, talk about creating not only economic havoc, but he said something like that could prevent someone who should go to the hospital for a heart attack. Now, yes, I know there are a lot of people who are here, stay away from the emergency department, you know, don't go near it. Um, I'll say this on behalf of every one of my emergency medicine colleagues across the country. We're open. If something bad is going on and you feel you need to see us, we're there. That doesn't change. The point of saying stay away from the ER was like, if you're asymptomatic and want to test, don't come for that. We are available for almost anything else. So on that part of it, I would have to say on behalf of everybody who I know who does emergency medicine work, that part is incorrect. I hope that answers uh, the question from the, the caller. Seth, do you want to jump in or can I just make a couple of... Go right ahead. So, I mean, I, I would just go back to something that uh, Jill said before when, when he spoke, which is, well, I'd say three things. So the first is that right now, as far as we know, COVID-19 is at least twice as infectious as the flu typically is. And so if one person gives one person the flu, coronavirus, you're giving it to two people. It's also 10 times as deadly, potentially, right? that may in the coming days come down. It's at least three times as deadly. But I think most importantly, as Joel said before, if 80% of the cases are either minimally symptomatic or potentially not symptomatic, then that means that we have the potential to introduce or reintroduce into the workforce individuals who are not sick, as Joel just said, in the absence of testing, who would potentially put other high-risk people at significant risk. I think that's really the challenge here is we just can't yet identify when it's 100% quote-unquote safe to re-enter the workforce. And arguably, if you could protect, if you think about it theoretically, if we all literally sat in our homes for two weeks and had contact with no one, arguably the virus would begin to go away. Now that's really hard to do, right? And it's not perfect as we heard, the virus can live longer than that, potentially. But if we really all did that, what would the virus do? So I think, I agree with, with uh, Joel's critique, I think, you know, it's a little premature to sort of jump right back into it. The financial devastation is absolutely significant. It's more than significant, but I don't necessarily think that this is overhyped. This is a real thing. Seth? No, I think you, you actually said it correct. I, at this point, it, um, what you were referring to is what we call the R value on, on how infective uh, the influenza virus is compared to the um, coronavirus and you're absolutely 100% correct. 
uh, we are now realizing that this is as infectious as, if not more than the influenza virus. So that's why the social distancing, what we call now the, the containment and the mitigation phases of, of, of epidemiology need to be really enforced uh, in order for us to flatten this curve or else uh, it, can, it can potentially be longer uh, than we expect it to be. But you're absolutely correct. So we uh, got another question. One was addressed to me, and, and if any of our docs want to jump in, please do so. And it's about kind of the uh, ethical dilemma of, uh, of healthcare providers. Um, and one, one of the questioners asked uh, kind of from the Jewish perspective, and, and I'd be curious if you have anything to say as a, as a medical professional too, um, both in terms of how much one can or should put themselves at risk in, in treating patients and also kind of the ethics of rationing care, right? In terms of, you know, when you have, and you see what's happening in Italy and God forbid it should happen here, though some say that it might get to that point where we need to make some very hard decisions as to whether, you know, who gets care and who doesn't get care and are there metrics that can be uh, made for that. Um, obviously, these are these are very hard questions, um, and I, I'll admit that I, uh, when I got one of them today, I've been emailed with Rabbi Danny Nevins <coughs> of uh, the Jewish Logical Seminary, who was supposed to be our speaker last week on, on ethics to uh, on artificial intelligence, um, which uh, to help think some of these through. Um, one thing I'll say is uh, is Moshe Habertal, who's a, who's a who's a philosopher in Israel who writes a lot about Jewish law and ethics, actually had an article in the Jerusalem Post today about rationing care. And, uh, you know, he made the kind of pure ethical argument that, you know, a life is a life and we treat every life equally. And I think we'd all agree with that that's the case. I do think in situations like this, um, triage has to happen. And I know doctors deal with this on a regular basis. And uh, the, the exact uh, criteria for that um, is, is complicated. And, uh, and that's something I think that requires more thought. Uh, in terms of treating patients, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it, it's a mitzvah to be a doctor, right? Rapoya uh, Rapet, the Torah says, one should surely try to heal patients. Um, at the same time, you know, we have a, uh, the Torah also says that uh, we need to take care of our own health too. So I think it is um, maximizing the precautions you can take in order to do your jobs. And if, and as we were saying before with the question from uh, Dr. Sattel um, about dental um, um, procedures and things, that anything that is not pressing that uh, might put someone at risk should probably be pushed off, but things that are pressing, um, and you have someone right before you who needs care, um, you know, one needs to take necessary precautions and, and to do that. But I think that this is something that even could be a follow-up session that we could look at that, uh, to delve a bit deeper into. I'm curious yeah. if any of our doctors have any thoughts on any of those questions. Um, as a guy who basically does that, I don't do that stuff every day, um, but um, so I, I'll, I'll be open and honest for now. I, I've done this job for about 25 years. Um, I, every time I say I've seen everything, something else happens. Uh, but I can honestly say this is probably the first time in 25 years where when I walk into the emergency room, I think twice for a second. And I've taken care of people with Ebola and I've taken care of people with every permutation of disease imaginable at this point. But this is the first time that I walk in. I'm like, you know what? I need to be extra careful. Um, there have been situations where, you know, I've been involved in, in multiple traumas and we've had to make decisions as, you know, who's going to the operating room and who isn't. Um, those are tough decisions. And if you watched any of the interviews with uh, the intensive care physicians in Italy, um, it's, it's not, this is not an easy decision. How you make that call, I don't know. And, and, I suspect it's on some sort of utilitarian level, I guess would be the coldest way to do it, although that's not an answer either. Um, I don't think that the, most of the countries at the point they have to think about that yet. Uh, to be honest, I think there are sections in New York where they are 24 to 48 hours from having to make those decisions, from what I'm hearing, where it's going to be very hard decisions about when, when all the respirators are used and they're split up so they can handle two patients at the same time and they still can't handle the volume. I think those decisions are gonna be made, I'm guessing in the next couple of days. And then as that trickles down to other communities, I, I think people have to make those decisions. How you make it is, um, it's, it's one, I mean, it's just one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do, period. I don't so, know if that means, yeah, for yeah, so 
I would like to take it from the hospital administrator side of this, uh, not only being a physician, but being a hospital administrator. One of the most difficult things to do is, is, not, to, is not to be able to provide your staff and your patients with the necessary resources. There's only so much of, of the resources that can go around. Um, and to say to, to your staff that you're going to have everything you need to take care of these patients is, is what you want to say. But, in the, in, but the, the, the reality is that we're coming to points of breaking points where physicians and hospitals are not going to have what we need to, to help people. And we're already seen as, as Joel alluded in New York and it's on the, you know, the daily post headlines of, of, of physicians and nurses wearing garbage bags for gowns. We go to medical school to help people, to take care of people. We don't go to medical school to make decisions that somebody else should be making above us uh, in regards to life and death. Um, it's a very difficult decision to make. Uh, some of the data from Washington, and some of the physicians have already talked about uh, with, you know, withholding care and choosing who is going to get the ventilator. If there's one ventilator left, if there's two people, one of the advanced age and one of the young age, who's going to get it? These are decisions that we, we never want to make. Uh, but unfortunately, these are decisions that are being thought about at this time. Um, so do we want to do that? No. Will it come to that? Possibly. We're starting to see New York facilities run out of necessary equipment to help people. Uh, that's why it's, it's so vitally important to stay out of the hospital if you don't need it, social distance yourselves, take care of yourselves, hand hygiene, uh, and look out for one another uh, because we are getting close to that tipping point uh, in the next one to two weeks, I think, is really going to be uh, vital to know where we're going here, especially in the Northeast. And, all right. Our... Uh... Final question for the evening, and then we'll, we'll close things out. Um, it's the question I think that's on everybody's mind, and I think I know the answer, but um, you know, we'll put it out there anyway. So when's this gonna be over? <laughs> and I think that means you know, the social distancing and also just the COVID-19 crisis. And, and along with that, you know, uh, a question came in, once the, you know, once the curve flattens and restrictions begin to lift, you know, how will people who are at risk, elderly, immunocompromised, how will they know how to proceed? Um, what sort of guidance do you think they'll, they'll have to have and what will have to do before they return to, uh, to normal life? So I would like to plagiarize somebody, and, and that's Dr. Anthony Fauci, who said last night uh, during his press conference, and someone asked him that question exactly, when do you think this is going to be over? And his answer was simple, when the virus says it's over. Uh, we, we, we don't know when it's gonna be over. Um, we can do all that we can do in regards to containment and mitigation. But the data from China said that the plateau before the flattening of the curve took about two months. South Korea took about a month, and about a month or so. Um, it's difficult to assess, it's difficult to predict, we don't know. Um, but we do know what we can do to help flatten that curve and get, get us to the point where we want it over sooner or later. Um, so unfortunately, like how we started this talk this evening, there's a lot of things we don't know, that being one of them at this point. Yeah. Jeff, you want to go or should I take this? No, I was just going to say that um, that's usually the question I ask somewhere between day six and seven of Pesach. So <laughs> I have a better answer. Um, <laughs> So I think anyone who can answer this question either has a direct line better than yours, Rabbi Peltz, upstairs, so to speak, or has a crystal ball that no one knows about. That said, um, you know, Seth's right. I don't think anybody has really an idea, but to build on a bit of what Seth said, in a couple points. First of all, in China, it's China. They have the ability and the power and authority to put everyone in their house and you cannot come out for any reason for 14 days, 28 days, whatever it was, and that's it. Now, we're doing, I think, a reasonably good job in the United States managing to keep 330 million people in their houses, but they don't stay in their houses. So there's a little bit of that cross interaction that occurs. So I don't think we will flatten the curve to the same degree that China did, because we simply can't. Let's just, we have to be realistic about, you know, the way our society works versus, you know, China. Um, so I think our curve will come down a little bit slower than China's did. The other thing is that people need to realize that when the curve, when you hit the peak and you're on the way down, it's still transmitting. So unless you hit the bottom, 
those people who to say, oh, I'm going to, oh, it's a beautiful day. I'm opening the door and going out. That's still on the way down. People can still pick up the disease. Um, they may not pick it up at the same rate. Uh, so as far as the older patients, who, who uh, older people who want to go back to their regular lives, I don't know that there's an answer there. Um, a couple of things I think people could probably safely assume to be in their houses, I'm guessing until late April at the earliest. I think earlier than that would be naive, um, and it may be longer. Um, uh, I also am willing to bet that there will be a point in the near future where we will simply not be testing anybody because we will hit a point in the community that the disease will be so prevalent that we'll say, look, if you have a high fever and a cough and shortness of breath, you have the flu, which by the way, we have the coronavirus, which by the way is very similar to what we do near the end of a flu season. So once you're in January, or February in a flu season, we don't really test for the flu anymore because, well, once we know it's in the community, we know it's okay, you have, this is the flu. We don't even test for it. I think that's gonna happen with coronavirus as well. Exactly when that tipping point is, I don't know. Um, long story short, I think until Jeff and his colleagues manage to uh, come up with something that will uh, <laughs> save us all, um, I think we're in this for a fairly long stretch. And, and the one thing I would add to that is, again, you've heard each of us, though, say that you, you can do things about this. Okay. So far from being powerless, just simply washing your hands will make a tremendous difference in your life, in the potential exposure, and in others that you may or may not come in contact with. So there's a tremendous amount that each of us can do. And absolutely, as Joel said, our hope is also that there are new therapeutics, that there are new vaccines over the next weeks to months. And so I'm hopeful, although we don't have that crystal ball, that we will have more solutions moving forward. Great. Well, I'm hopeful that with uh, talented doctors and medical professionals like you and many who are on the call in our community and around our country and the world, that uh, we will be able to uh, move from this, uh, from this pandemic to, uh, to better times together. And I want to uh, thank uh, very much uh, Joel and Seth and, and Jeff for volunteering to do this and being on the call. I found it to be tremendously helpful and, um, and, uh, and clarifying for a lot of the pieces that are going on there as much as we know. And we really appreciate you doing this and we're happy we were able to do this as part of the Dr. Jeffrey Kramer Bioethics Initiative. And um, we'll see what uh, we can continue to, uh, to tackle with this as, uh, as we go forward. Um, as we conclude tonight, um, I wanted to conclude together with a, with a prayer. Um, it's a prayer that was written by Rabbi Martin Samuel Cohen, who's a uh, rabbi in New York. Um, and I think it addresses our situation we're at right now, and also our hopes um, for where we get in the future, as well as praying for and thanking our medical professionals who are on the front lines of this too. So though we're all muted, that's probably better. I'd uh, ask that we read this together um, in the English at the top as uh, we conclude this evening. Avino Malkeno, dear God in heaven, protect our families, our friends, and our neighbors as we negotiate these troubled seas in which we find ourselves afloat. Ever mindful of the fact that we are all your creatures, we turn to you for guidance and for strength as we pray that the public officials charged with bringing us through this crisis be granted wisdom, intelligence, and insight, born of compassion and charity. And we pray too that the physicians, nurses, and hospital employees who are on the front lines be spared all distress and disease as they care for the stricken, for the elderly, and for the infirm. Most of all, we pray that you look with kindness and generosity on all of us, and particularly on those already infected for whose recovery we this day ardently pray, as it is written in your holy Torah, cry the Almighty and the source of your healing. And we all say, Amen. May all those who will have a refuah shlema, full recovery, and may all of us have that refuah shlema, not just physically, but also soul as well. As we know, we're all uh, doing our best to move through this challenging time. But the fact, even though we're physically distant, we're spiritually close to one another. We look forward to seeing what our other programs and services and experiences that we have uh, going on through Zoom. Um, and uh, please, please do reach out if there's anything we can do or help with. We know of anybody who's in need of, uh, of comfort and needs some consolation of a conversation or of a uh, food or anything like that. We have volunteers ready to help. Um, so we appreciate everyone being on the call tonight. And I wish everybody a Lila Tov, a uh, good evening. Thank you for being here.